Welcome to Tank Talks, your personal think tank for startups and venture capital. I'm your host, Matt Cohen, founder and managing partner at Ripple Ventures. This week's episode is a conversation I had on Clubhouse with Andrew Merrick and Jeff Leathers from Carta to discuss SPVs, special purpose vehicles. We discuss what they are, why people use them, some best practices on how to set them up, and ways Carta is helping to streamline the process. These guys really know their stuff, and it was a fun conversation to have. Now let's get into the episode. Obviously, we got Andrew here, everyone, uh, who's the operations manager at Carta, focused on SPV administration. Andrew's uh, been doing this for over six years in fund administration and venture capital and hedge funds and four years of banking experience. Thanks uh, so much for, for joining us here on stage tonight, uh, Andrew, to talk about SPVs and, and working venture capital. I guess, you know, for, for the audience, why don't we start off and just sort of talk about what is an SPV and, and why anyone ever decides to create them? I just want to kick it off with a small disclaimer first that uh, we're not providing any legal or tax advice here. Uh, We just always recommend that you would consult an attorney or a tax professional. Any opinions expressed here are my own views and not the views of Carta necessarily. Jeff just joined us. So brief background on Jeff. He's also a product manager at Carta. For the last couple of years, he was previously product strategy at Plaid and Bloomberg, and he's got his MBA from Morton. Thanks for joining us, Jeff. Thanks, Matt. Happy to be here uh, with Andrew and you. Awesome. All right, Jeff. All right, Andrew, let's kick it off. Why create an SPV and what is one? Yeah, so an SPV is uh, just a single asset fund. Um, So it's a targeted company that uh, most investors already know what it's going to be. So it's unlike a traditional fund, which is technically a blind pool of investments where you don't know which companies are going to be invested in. Um, And why create it? Uh, You want to create it for a lot of different reasons. Uh, Traditional fund managers... Uh, will do it as like a a co-invest alongside their primary fund. Uh, Or if the risk appetite of the fund doesn't match that investment, they might do it for that reason alone is to keep it the the risk isolated and allow investors who want to take partake join there. Uh, For emerging managers, it's really they're making it because they want to prove track record and because they have the opportunity. A lot of them are interested in angel investing themselves and others are looking to make that professional jump where they want to go from you know, managing one or two SPVs to managing a traditional fund. So it, it, it really becomes a lot of different reasons, but those are you know, some basic ways why. Yeah. And I think like a lot of people just looked at the process as being a ton of friction, a lot of like hoops and bounds to jump through to get going in venture capital or just investing in, you know, friends, businesses and SPVs were a great way to kind of bridge them into that, you know, direct investment side of things. But what about the transition into like venture capital and why they've taken off in the last little while? There was a lot of people that were against them probably in, you know, the previous decade uh, and using SPVs. But they've really taken off. So why do you and Jeff think that venture funds love them so much? Yeah, I mean, the the reason that we've seen is that they're just really, really versatile. You know, I I just recently, you know, wrote a blog post um, around SPVs and uh, for Carta. And, you know, really like the opening line was that they're the Swiss army knife of the venture industry. And so, you know, like Andrew was saying, there's a bunch of things that these things can do. And we've seen people come in wanting to put tons of different things in SPV. So obviously early stage investments are one, but people put crypto in these people put, I, one guy came in and he wanted to put uh, thoroughbred horses into an SPV. So it really <laughs> runs the gambit in terms of uh, what we've seen people try and do with these. But the typical things that we're seeing, the most common, the reason that VCs like it is uh, for follow on investment. So, you know, everyone has, if you know, if you have a fund, you have a reserve strategy, you're setting aside 30%, 50%, something for reserves to do follow on investments. Uh, if you blow through that, if you have a real winner that's going longer than you, than you think, you want to t- keep uh, taking advantage of that, um, you have pro rata rights in it. And then, you know, you can use an SPV to give your LPs or anyone out there, uh, you know, sort of monetize that access. The other thing that we've seen is that, you know, if you have an investment that you have high conviction in, but it's outside of your core thesis. So, you know, you're supposed to, in, you know, be investing in early stage health tech and you find something in fintech uh, that you think that, you know, some LPs would be interested in. You can shop that around and get some exposure to that. And then, you know, some of the, some of the other things we've seen are, you know, people, you know, VCs, uh, they mitigate the risk of exposure to having ownership to multiple 
uh, you know, to too much ownership. So in your LPA, you might have a 10% ownership limit on any one security. And, uh, and you know, if, if you start getting close up to that, you might use an SPV rather than that. And then I guess the last thing that, you know, we've seen is that this is really a benefit as well to LPs. So we see this a lot with emerging managers that when they're raising their first fund, they will offer these, uh, these cheap, uh, usually, you know, zero um, management fee investment vehicles, uh, especially to their anchor LPs as a way for their LPs to get direct exposure via co-investments into some of these investments. Uh, but uh, sort of the LPs are able to average down their costs. So, so those are some of the reasons that we've seen VC investors particularly like these uh, vehicles. Yeah, I mean, there's uh, a ton of reasons why people think there's a ton of benefit to them, but there's also a lot of kind of friction and a lot of things people don't like about them. I've heard a lot of institutional investors don't like when uh, emerging managers use them because they find it a distraction or they find that it's like building in fees on top of fees. Um, first off, I got to ask, whatever happened with that uh, thoroughbred horse SPV? Did it do well? We didn't end up actually doing it, but the the, the guy, uh, he had he had put in there the a pretty high hurdle rate for himself. He, he had uh, put in, I think, a 10% hurdle rate on his own SPV. So I think he was pretty confident in the um, in the performance of these horses, so. <laughs> That's hilarious. I think like a lot of people talk about um, using SPVs as a way to mitigate risk. I kind of look at it a little bit different. If you're going in with an SPV as your first investment into a company, you're taking the opposite of diversification. You're actually going one bet, all in, 100%, do or die. And if it doesn't work out, that's not great. However, using SPVs as a follow-on after you've made your investment from, let's say, your traditional venture fund, that makes a lot more sense to me. And I think it makes a lot of sense to institutional LPs. So how do you think about people just setting up random SPVs for one-off investments when they're kind of saying, okay, I'll put you know, $5,000 or less of my own money on the line, and I'll go raise a million from everybody else. There's a little bit of a, a tricky act to play with that, don't you think? There, there's a lot of individuals in SPVs. So some of them are first time LPs. Uh, some of them are, are just people who, you know, have high conviction and, and want into the company. Um, for, for institutional investors, though, you're right. We don't typically see a lot of them jumping at the chance to join an SPV, but that's largely, you know, historically they're, they're not covered well. They're not admined well. They're not, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of friction, like you said, that's centered around the, the raise process, but also the dissolution um, and the ongoing tracking of the SPV itself. A lot of times investors will want to see, uh, institutional investors will want to see managers have a more hands-on approach, not not to be distracting, but more so uh, just to make sure that their risk is mitigated and that they're covering and can trust the manager themselves. Yeah, it's like augmenting some type of risk, not just like trying to disassociate yourself from complete risk is what I think you're saying. And, and that makes sense. I think like a lot of people just throw an SPV up on AngelList or something, not to give them, you know, free advertisement, but like, hey, I mean, I'm raising a million dollars for this you know, deal I've done no research on. Come and join me and, and let's see how this works out. That's not probably what SPVs were technically created for. They were used as a way to help you uh, put more money behind an investment that you already put a lot of your own capital or fund investment capital behind. At least in the venture world, that's what it usually started off as. And now they've obviously morphed into more and more like one-off earlier, earlier stage, riskier one-off investments. But that's, you know, something else we can talk about later on. But what about the, the fee structure? How should, you know, SPV managers think about management fees versus carried interest when setting up their first few SPVs? So yeah, so there's a few different components that ways that you can charge fees on these. So the first is covering the admin expense. So that's, you know, some of the things that uh, American team work on, tax team works on, that type of thing. Um, for those fees, uh, typically what we see people do is they put an expense reserve into the SPV. So it's basically just an amount of cash that you carry in there to pay off the, the expenses. And that's sort of just they're pretty small usually. Um, they just cover sort of a minimum, uh, the minimum amount to keep the vehicle running, reporting, all the tax and everything in compliant. And then on top of that, there can be management fees, right? So management fees are actually paid to the manager of the entity. Um, so that would be something that sort of you just take as payment for sourcing the sourcing the investment and all that. 
typically for emerging managers, we do not see them uh, coming in with management fees. We, we do see it with people who have uh, long track records. They have existing funds that are charging management fees. And often they make, you know, they, ha they have some sort of management fee for sourcing this. And it's, it is definitely a negotiating point uh, that you can have. But emerging managers, when they're just getting set up, or like I said, when they're offering these as co-investment vehicles along with their fund, they will typically just do an expense reserve, no management fee. And then the last piece is carry. And that's that's where typically people are expecting to to make their money on these is is using the carry. Uh, and so, you know, for carry amounts that we see, you know, the most common still, I, from what I've seen is 20%. There's an argument, you know, one of the things that people don't like about SPVs versus a fund is that with a fund, you get carry on the overall uh, fund. So, you know, sort of your, your winners and losers average out. And um, as the GP, you only get carry on sort of the, the return of the overall fund is typically the way it works. It's called a European waterfall. And then, uh, but on SPVs, you're getting carry on each SPV. So you imagine that um, you get all the upside, but any of them that go to zero, they don't really count against you. And so typically, you know, I've, I've seen a break even kind of analysis done on this and it's about uh, an 18% carry on an SPV equates to about a 20% carry on a fund. So we do see some people going uh, lower with the SPV carry, sometimes down to 10, but usually uh, 15 or 18% um, for the overall SPV carry. Now, are you seeing any hurdles in uh, fees? We have been seeing an increase in the number of hurdles. Uh, I was actually looking at one this morning. Yeah, so just so everyone knows, a hurdle out there basically means the carry is not given to the sponsor or the, the SPV manager until a certain uh, rate of return has been achieved. Now, obviously in venture, a 4% annual hurdle doesn't really mean much when you're going for you know 20 plus IRR and usually there's a catch up. So meaning once you cross that hurdle, the first profit goes to the, the manager and then the rest goes after split 80, 20 or whatever the, the carry is. Uh, so you are seeing more hurdles. What, what would you say like kind of the average hurdle is on some of these earlier stage SPVs or is it hard to say? It's hard to say, it really depends on the manager, um, but 8% is usually probably I would say a common one. Yeah, 8% non-cumulative year by year? Yeah, 8% IRR. Right, and and what's the life of these SPVs you're typically setting up for people? Uh, typically only three to five years, but you know, like you mentioned earlier, there's a lot of people who are getting in at, at seed stage or A stage. And, and you know, historically speaking, uh, SPVs were largely for B, C, or D rounds, uh, you know, because the managers have higher conviction in those companies. Right, right. That makes sense. So let's talk about a problem that we often hear about it, which is the chicken and the egg, which means, you know, the SPV is looking to be raised on a specific investment. Uh, the manager uh, pitches the founder and says, hey, you know, I'm interested in committing to your round. I can get, you know, one to $10 million, whatever the number is. And then oftentimes they have to go and, and raise that afterwards and they sometimes fall short. So what advice would you give to managers so they don't get caught up in this chicken and egg trap? It's really tough, to be honest. And, and a lot of it I don't personally see because I'm more on the admin side. Uh, I'm not out there raising the fund, but it, it is very tough for a manager to, to source the deal and to source the LPs. A lot of times uh, these are fast moving SPVs where these things have to happen you know, within a month. You know, LPs don't always have time to do the due diligence that they normally do for a, for a fund. And, and then uh, you know, the manager has to make that juggle of, how much money is going to come in and how much can I give this company? How much is that company giving me? Uh, they, they often have to you know, reconcile their relationship with the companies. Uh, they don't want to overcommit uh, if they don't know the company that well or if they don't know the LPs that well. So it is a struggle. Really, the best thing that, that, that can happen is to just be very clear and upfront with the, the investors, with the LPs. Set the expectations early on that you need an answer by you know, X date, and these are the things to expect. Uh, if something happens where we don't get the full allocation or we get extra allocation, these are the scenarios. It's a very good uh, you know, relationship to have uh, that clear expectation. Uh, it's good for all parties involved. And you know, a lot of times the companies will also know that you know, it is an SPV and, and they will get around that. But you don't want to be out there, you know, saying that you can raise a million if you can only raise four hundred thousand. The other thing is to know, know your investor base well. So, you know, like like uh, Merrick was saying, you know, setting up those expectations with them and really understanding what each of their appetite is for these different things. So, everyone that I've seen, you know, they've all got their their go to investors that they 
they know, hey, this person is really down for, you know, whatever deal I throw at them. They just, they want deal flow. And there's other people that might be more selective. And so kind of understanding, you know, who those people are that you can really count on to set a minimum bar of what you consider. And then going out and making sure that you can sort of set up that minimum bar, you know, establish what you need. And then, and then you can, you know, go up from there in terms of the allocation. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. I mean, we are uh, SPV users at Ripple Ventures where we've done a handful of them. And we definitely make sure our founders know like there's a range between what our minimum and our maximum is. We often hit our maximum or go beyond, but it's about setting that expectation on the minimum to get to what that minimum is. You need kind of like an anchor LP to make sure they're there for that, you know, half a million or a million to start. And then you have sort of flexibility going up and down the stack. And then with Ripple Capital, which we do later stage sort of pre-IPO secondaries, we definitely have an anchor because we need to be very clear on what we can afford to, to purchase and then get a, approval from like the companies and stuff. And so creating that like clarity on what's your minimum and what's your maximum, especially with the founders, I, I think is a really good piece of advice for people. The other problem is though, let's say you do have a hot deal and you have to deal with allocations. So how do you think people should be dealing with allocations if you end up uh, raising too much uh, or too little, I guess, uh, and you don't, um, you don't have enough supply to fill that demand? Yeah, I mean, so obviously what you were mentioning there about just being very upfront with the with the founder about uh, what you can do. Um, and obviously these days, seeing a lot of things that are oversubscribed seems to be more the norm uh, than going the other way. I, from what, I, what I've seen that the only like little tip and trick I have here is that once again, having that investor that you can count on, you know, maybe that person who you're really comfortable with, um, you keep them in the wings in case you're over allocated. What you really want to avoid is having to send back, you know, $300, $500 to every LP because you're cutting down everyone on a pro rata basis, you know, equal, like proportional to their commitments. You know, it's just kind of a, a headache and it's just a lot of communication to have to send back that tiny bit of money. So just the tip here is to, you know, find one LP who you think is, you know, good for a larger amount or good for a smaller amount if, if, if they're okay with it. And then uh, sort of keep them in the wings. And at the end, just cut them down if you go uh, over allocate and cut them down. I've, I've seen people do that and it really reduces the, the headache of having to send back money to every LP. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. For us, we ask our LPs, like, what's the minimum and the maximum you would be willing to take? Uh, just so we know if we have an oversubscribed situation, which could be like 3x, are you able to do that? Or would you just, you know, walk from the deal if you get less than, you know, a certain amount? We are very transparent with that with our LPs. So it's an ongoing process. The thing is also, you know, you, you kind of mentioned it, like, just tracking during this process, tracking the LPs and and making sure you know where everyone's at, it can start to pile up quickly, right? I mean, if you need to have 15, 20, 30 more people into the SPV, well, maybe you need to talk to a lot more than that. And it starts to get to be a lot of administrative work. I mean, that's, that's where our team does come in and help, but also just on your side, making sure that you're tracking everyone and, and what they're looking for. So it's pretty easy to get underwater with this. And by the end, realize that you, you, you messed up a zero somewhere or something and, uh, and you realize you're off on the allocation. So good organization and having a good team behind you is really important. Yeah. So let's talk about the admin stuff. I mean, that's what you guys you know, make bank on. So, you know, the legals, the process of getting it all set up, it is a pain in the ass. I've had to do it several times. You know, what kind of advice do you offer uh, people looking to set up their SPVs from a legal standpoint? So I'm not a lawyer. Merrick's an accountant. I'm on the product team. Um, you know, we have carved out this process um, that, that works really smoothly for getting, you know, these SPVs uh, set up. I mean, there's a few things that you kind of need. I mean, I'll just kind of run through the steps quickly. The first thing you need is like to understand which entity type you're going for. There's limited liability companies, so an LLC. There's a series LLC structure. There's a limited partnership, so an LP structure. The most common thing we see is a an LLC. This is actually really just a carryover from the real estate space where, where SPDs were kind of invented um, and they use LLCs there. There's not much other reason than that. They, they are partnerships. They, they, they look and behave like partnerships. So we see that commonly. Series LLCs are quite common with the more budget platforms uh, to use those because they do uh, reduce the administrative uh, work in setting them up. But the way we have it set up on Carta, at least, it's quite easy to set up. Uh, so series LLC isn't usually necessary. And then an LP structure can be done if 
you know, there's a, there's a few regulatory reasons that you might want to do it, but regular LLC is the most common thing that we see. So that's what you need. You need to file for that in Delaware. You need to get an EIN for that entity. So those are some of the, some of the things that services like ours abstract away from you. The other thing you need is you need an operating agreement. So you want something pretty ironclad. It's a legal agreement between you and your LPs. Uh, you know, a lot of times it doesn't matter too much, but uh, sometimes the edge cases come up or you have the next Uber on your hands and you want to make sure that everything is really battened down. So having high high quality operating agreement, um, subscription agreement, PPM, all those things um, is important. You can have an attorney draft those from you for you. Um, or if you have something more cookie cutter, you know, just a normal SPV, you can use a service like Carta. Typically it covers fees and carry. Those are the only things that really change. Most of the things are boilerplate other than that. And the last thing is regulatory filing. So regulatory filings, it's, it's mostly so you file a uh, form D with the SEC usually want to do that before or at least within 15 days of the, the offering. That's that's fairly straightforward. And the other thing is uh, blue sky filings. And uh, blue sky filings are similar to Form D, but they're done on a state-by-state -state basis. They're very simple, but they, they are fees to pay to each state. Most of them are free or a couple hundred bucks. New York is the big one. I think it can be up to twelve hundred dollars to do your uh, blue sky filings. But for that, we, you know, that's the kind of thing. If you, you know, consult with an attorney, they can let you know, you know, how much of that it makes sense given the size of your SPV and the risk profile and all that. If you want to do filings uh, for Form D or blue sky filings, all this is a uh, type kind of the stuff that is involved in the legal part of setting up the, the Delaware entity, the operating agreement, and then um, getting the regulatory filings done. Wow. It's a lot more complicated than people really think. I mean, that's why services like Carta exist, because there's a lot of heavy lifting to get this thing up and running. And then afterwards, you're you're on the hook for reporting requirements, tax filings, all those types of things, which I think you guys really help with on, on that side as well, don't you, uh, Merrick? Yeah, that's right. We we do the uh, you know financial statements. And at Carta, we try to provide a, a more of a real-time SOI so that investors know exactly where the fund stands. Uh, they know that since it's a single asset, they know how much uh, the carrying value of a given investment is. So it, they're able to track that more real-time. And then the other thing too is engaging with the tax partners to, to really get those K-1s prepared and, and accurate are key for an ongoing administrative uh, standpoint. And I, I've been working with Jeff for you know the better part of a year now, trying to automate as much as we can on this front-loaded uh, part of the, the process because it's really the most important. It impacts investors, it impacts the manager, and it impacts my team, uh, the fund administrators. So we, we need to have that part buttoned up in order to provide a good process for all. And then there's like, you know, cool stuff that can happen after the fact, but the, the core is really just getting that stuff down from day one. The reporting stuff is definitely really important. I know for us, you know, we do quarterly reports on, on the companies uh, and then annual reports and, and financials, but what are you seeing when people don't have access to the companies for any information rights? You know, let's say it's a big private company. How do they get people up? That really depends on the uh, relationship that the manager has with the company. They, they should be trying to fight for you know, some base level rights to just know that there's been a new round. Those can be hard to come by as well. Typically, what, we'll, what we would recommend is you know, try to stay glued in uh, to the ecosystem of whatever company you are investing in. Because that's you, you'll you'll start to hear stuff you know in the wind and on the side, uh, and it's a, you're able to you know sometimes go to the company and just ask a simple question of, hey, I heard there was a new round. Can you uh, give a little bit of detail on the price per share? We need it for our, our administrators. You know that that can happen, but other times we just see uh, the investor the investments uh, being held at cost until uh, dissolution. Uh, it becomes a tricky situation. And, you know, our, our viewpoint is really uh, more transparency is, is better. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, it, it, it becomes tricky, though. I mean, a lot of these companies are just not giving up a lot of information. So LPs, I guess, have to expect that going into it. What type of stuff should founders watch out for when speaking with investors and, you know, find out that their investors looking to be uh, putting in money through an SPV? You talked about this a little bit earlier that, you know, people do not like and, and founders I've specifically seen not liking uh, when people shop around their SPVs very widely, typically when they list it on a site where it's pretty publicly available. You know, you're trying to raise around and 
you're trying to build uh, some sort of scarcity and people you know, really want to have that access. When someone lists up access to your round uh, in a way that anyone has it to, it can be problematic for those founders. So they typically don't like to see that. And obviously the relationship between the VC and the founder um, during a deal like this is, is really, really important. So um, that's one thing you know, that founders should watch out for that someone, you know, it has happened obviously where people kind of don't really tell you how they're going to be getting these LPs and it goes much wider than you think. And maybe, you know, information about the round uh, and those types of things get out. The other thing of course, is that, you know, these SPVs, if you're looking for someone who's going to be a value add, you know, it, you should really be looking for funds in SPV. They're one-time investment vehicle. So you really can't count on someone who's coming in, just be an SPV to, to really want to, you know, bridge you to the next round or, or be there for you or, or double down on these investments. So as a, as a founder, I think they are a very good way of bringing in capital. They're a good way of, you know, being able to bring in uh, family and friends onto the cap table, uh, raised from a large number of strategic, uh, you know, smaller investors like angels. Uh, but they're 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 definitely not a replacement for uh, having very good venture capital partners on your cap table. I think a lot of the things that you guys mentioned are, are, are really important. But I know you're not sitting on the investment side all the time. You're kind of sitting on the the product and the admin side. You know, from from my perspective at Ripple, we are very uh, adamant about not doing SPVs outside of our focus areas. Uh, and so we know the companies very well. We have relationships with the founders. The only thing we do do SPVs for are some of those later stage pre-IPOs that we get access to from our existing, you know, uh, employee founder network. So those companies have a little bit more of a information trail, I think. So it's not really like we're showing them a brand new deal. But what happens if someone uh, you know, comes to you and says, hey, I'm looking to raise an SPV. This is the company. I've, I know a little bit about the company. This you know, fund is leading it. What sort of questions do you think LP should be asking those SPV uh, managers when they're getting ready to, to consider contributing as an LP? If I was an LP, I would want to know really two things. And one is, uh, you know, as much information about the company as possible, um, whether that's just basic company information, but also why does the manager have conviction in this company? Do they just kind of tangentially know it and, and it's a buzz or is it more of like they have conviction because they see the vision, they, they know where this thing could go. So that's, that's the one thing. And then the other thing really is, just expectations. So what are going to be the expectations of you from me as an LP? Do I have to do this stuff quickly? Am I going to be um, you know, following on? When do I have to contribute? Is there any other future capital calls or expense calls that have to be made? Um, but also on the flip side, uh, as an LP, I would expect certain things from my manager. Uh, so, so the expectations do go both ways. And you know, as an LP, generally they want to see some kind of reporting being done or, or maintained so that it's not just, you know, invest and, and forget about it for four years. They want to know what they're going to get at the end of the year or at the end of the, the cycle. So expectations both ways. And then also, uh, you know, understanding the company. Yeah, for sure. What's the largest SPV you guys have seen with like the individuals invested as LPs? At Carta, I think we've we only have under a hundred. And what would be the best returned SPV you've seen? Not specific, but you know, to who it was, but just what was like the best SPV set up in the last couple of years that you've seen return? I was working on one this morning with a, a 70% IRR. The, the fund administration unit here at Carta has only been around for you know almost three years now. Uh, so we, we haven't seen a ton of exits uh, just from our client base. Yeah. I'm sure Jason Calacanis has some uh, ones that he'd like to talk about. Something I've been thinking a lot about with some of these, you know, companies going public via SPAC and, and direct listings and stuff. What are you seeing people request more from an LP perspective at the wind up stage? So an SPV, uh, let's say, is into uh, Coinbase. Uh, Coinbase is going into a direct listing now and people want to have access to their shares, even though those shares are still, let's say, restricted or something. How do you see that wind up going these days? It goes the same way as any other traditional IPO. There's still a lockup period. Um, there's still things that have to be done on the admin side for not only the SPV that you're managing, but also on the company side in order to transfer the shares uh, from, to the right owner. The way SPACs are going, it's really, it, it's, it's, you've definitely seen an increase in a secondary market right before IPO. Uh, and a lot of those are being done through an SPV. 
Yeah, but I mean, like in terms of LPs requesting the cash or the uh, the stock portion, I assume a lot of them want the stock. Uh, it's a good question. Um, we've seen a mix of both uh, from the you know the few that have happened in the past couple months, um, but it's sometimes manager led. It's not always the LPs making the decision. Um, sometimes there's only one or two LPs that are you know adamant about one or the other. But at the end of the day, it's the manager who has to make the best decision for everybody. You know, we, we would have to take a look at the LPA to see, can that be done where, you know, one person gets shares and other people get uh, cash? Uh, you know, that's up to the LPA. Because mm -hmm. what we're seeing from our like pre-IPO secondary uh, SPVs is a lot of people are requesting the, the stock so that they can... Uh, you know, they have their own tax situations and things like that. They may want to hold on to it for forever. And some people just are, are happy with that. But I know it is a little bit more uh, of a process to be able to distribute it from you know your brokerage account to uh, individual LPs and things like that. So I was just curious what you're seeing some of the LPs doing with their SPVs out there. So I know we can't talk about Carta X, but anything you can share in terms of like what the vision or what the initial use cases are going to be, uh, anything like that you can talk about? Because I know a lot of people are excited about it. We, we can talk briefly about, you know, some of the things that Carter X offers. And it's really to plug that gap, Matt, that you're talking about, which is that pre-IPO. We're ready to be play with the big boys, but not entirely ready to go public. Um, you know, that could be done for a variety of reasons. Um, really, what Carter X is there to do is to provide liquidity to all of the investors and all of the employees who have been working there for you know so many years. It's really to give that proof of concept, and you know there's there's listing requirements and financial disclosures and things of that nature. But it, it's it's an issuer led auction where uh, you know they're they're the ones um, providing liquidity to everyone. It's not just the people who have the, the couple of people that have connections to do a secondary. I'm really excited about it uh, because we've been playing in the secondary space. And just for everyone out there listening, so like the process for getting access to private companies' shares, typically, you know, existing employee or previous employees' stock options or common shares is a bit of a tedious process. You have to, one, you know, find and track down these sellers, usually through your own relationships or through lawyers or brokers. Uh, and then you have to agree on a price. You have to sign an agreement to transact, and then you have to notify company counsel or you know companies themselves. And then they have to you know uh, waive their rofer rights uh, on blocking a transaction, if, especially with a lot of companies in financings now or you know direct listings, SPACs, IPOs, whatever. They're in basically a blackout period, and they're not going to be willing to allow any shares to transact. And so therefore, you end up not being able to move forward with it. And so with Carta. I think because you have one access to the the cap table and the transparency on where everything sits, plus you obviously have access to company uh, counsel or just company management. I feel like the process is going to be a lot more seamless uh, and a lot more transparent for everyone's sake. Uh, so I'm personally excited about it. You don't have to say yes, I'm right or wrong, but you can just nod your head virtually. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's very very exciting. It's not only offering the the liquidity option, but it, like you said, we have the cap tables for a lot of these companies. So instead of having to do all of these manual offline processes and having these things go back and forth and get approvals and all, all these other filings, uh, it's it's all done you know within the Carta X ecosystem. Uh, if you if people want to learn more, they can go to carta.com slash X. It, it, it'll give you know some more insight and our team is happy to, you know, you know, field questions and and you know give more information about that. It's just an area that that we're not, you know, perfectly glued into. Uh, and for you know compliance reasons, we can't just you know talk in, in detail there. No, no worries. Um you know, for us at Ripple, we've been asking or basically begging all of our companies to get set up on Carta. We have a, a partnership with you guys for all of our companies to get set up with Carta. And we love it. I think it's it's just one of those things, cap table management, which is, you know, you're kind of bread and butter and you'll get into more stuff later on, hopefully with our companies. But it's just so important to have that uh, transparency. And it makes, you know, raising money a lot easier. It makes selling the company a lot easier. It makes doing anything from a corporate governance uh, perspective a lot easier. And as investors, minority investors ourselves, uh, it just is a, a huge breath of fresh air for early stage companies who don't think it's really important. I personally think it, it is one of the most important things a company can do besides obviously all the you know fires they're putting out on a day-to-day -day basis. 
Yeah, so I mean, obviously the thing that we are just sort of like uh, marketing this week is uh, Carta SPV. Um, so I, I put out a blog post that you can find it at carta.com forward slash SPV. Really, that's like the big thing that we're we're launching right now that I think is relevant here. Um, and really, you know, the idea was to fix some of the biggest problems that we found in SPVs. You know, like Merrick said, we've, we've been we've been doing uh, the admin work for SPVs for um, for several years now. And we've just heard from VC investors what all the biggest problems are uh, about this. And uh, we just set out to fix them. And so like, you know, some of the biggest ones have been the high cost of these things. Uh, if you do one of these with a hodgepodge of different service providers, you know, legal counsel, tax, et cetera, there's a lot of back and forth. Everyone there charges by the hour, which is not super fun. And uh, things start to pile up quickly. You know, these can typically range in, you know, 10K to set up the entity and then some annual fee to, to actually create, to, to run the entity over time. Um, and so, you know, what we're really setting out to do with this card SPV offering is to have, you know, a single provider with, you know, some partnerships in there, but a single uh, source that you can go to and, and one, you know, low sort of reasonable cost per year, rather than having a setup cost and a bunch of other variable costs that come in there that make it hard to budget. So the first thing we're doing is really trying to reduce costs. And, you know, the second thing we're doing is we're automating the heck out of everything. So I talked a little bit earlier about how we're, we have a digital form of the LPA. We have, uh, you know, that plugs into our distributions tool, which plugs into and also plugs into our, our general ledger, which is sort of the accounting software. Um, we're really just automating everything and making it all very push button and everything starts to, you know, fly by wire and, and, go pretty autom automatically. And, and that really frees up um, Merrick's team to provide better service. You know, you can hear Merrick is, uh, he's a pretty professional at this, but if he spends, you know, part of his day having to dig through an LPA and, and do all these calculations and find documents, uh, that's not the best use of his time. And so we're just automating the heck out of this thing front to back so that he has the time to, uh, you know, have these types of conversations that he's having this evening with everyone um, with customers on a daily basis. And then, uh, the last thing is just eliminating a headache for LPs and GPs. So the, the newest product we were just released on this is a, a subdocs closing tool. So we can take your, you know, custom operating agreement, like I was mentioned before, all your custom agreements. Um, and then we put it in with our sort of Carta standard questionnaire and we'll we put that on the platform and, and uh, you can invite LPs, they can fill out the documents. And the real promise of this is that, you know, uh, LPs, when they come in for the second time, this is a, a feature that we're going to be shipping uh, next month, or I guess this month at this point, is that LPs, when they come in for the second time, it's a single click to get into the SPV. So taking all that headache out of having people fill out documents multiple times for every SPV and having to answer all those questions. So those are some of the things that we're doing, right? Reducing costs, really providing really high service, high, high touch, high service um, stuff and automating the heck out of everything to take the headache out of this. So that's some of the stuff that's on the roadmap and some of the stuff we've been working on at Carta. And that subdoc, uh, that subdoc closing process is all done within the app. And it's a really good thing for me because I don't have to go and chase docs or, or you know, see an unexecuted version or is this person in or out? Uh, so it, it eliminates all the guesswork from an admin perspective. For managers, though, it's a great way to just know where your investors are at, who's in, who's out, who's uh, processing their docs, who's... Uh, you know, how much capital do I have? So a lot of the questions that you were asking earlier is about the allocation of like who's in and who's not. Uh, th this helps that manager plan for that. And then from an LP side, like Jeff said, you know, if, if we can automate this and make this, uh, you know, tied to a direct company uh, or a investing company, you know, they don't have to fill out the sub doc 15 times every time they invest. It's, it's just the one time and then, you know, confirm and verify that the information is still accurate. You know, that that end to end platform of uh, subscribing is uh, is going to be a, a big, big win for, for all parties involved. Wow, that's brilliant. That's like taking the company side's documents <clears throat> where you only have like one company data room and everything's the same for everyone who comes into it. But as an individual, maybe LP, you could also have your own data room where you have all your stuff and say, okay, I'm going to be in this deal and this deal and this deal. Instead of sending all your sub docs around or W8 bends and all that stuff around multiple times, you can have your own profile on Carta. Well, this has been an amazing chat. Thank you so much, Andrew and Jeff, for, for jumping in here on Clubhouse and talking about SPVs and just sharing all the ins and outs of it. I know personally, it's it's been a bit pain in the ass getting up and running, but once you get going and you start doing the first couple ones, it becomes like a, a walk in the park and it's all thanks to, to people like you in the ecosystem that are helping making it a lot easier. So thanks again. And thanks everyone for joining us. 
Thanks for having us, Matt. This was fun. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for listening. As always, if you enjoyed this episode, please leave a review on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcast. And make sure to give me a follow on Twitter at Matty B. Cohen or Clubhouse at Ripple underscore Ventures if you want to be a part of the audience and ask a question on our next Tank Talk. Till next time, 